Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is John Pachork. I have the privilege of serving as the Chief of Police for the Town of Deerfield. About four and a half years ago, I returned back to my hometown as Chief of Police and was blessed by the position. However, once I came back to Franklin County, I soon realized that Franklin County is at the forefront of many different opportunities across the state. And I had the opportunity to reconnect with many people that I've known over the years, John Merrigan, Dave Sullivan, and several other people on the panel that really have taken a proactive approach to the problems in society. And they're really concerned about people, and it's honestly a blessing. It's great, it's great to be back. It's great to be back in a county that actually cares about each other. We care about our neighbors. We care about our friends, our family, right through, and we wanna make people better. And that's the scary part about opioid addiction is that we're seeing it all over the place and it has no boundaries. So the partnership that's become of this group is utterly amazing. And it is touching the lives of people all across Franklin County. There are families that are struggling with this that are in our police station on a near daily basis, asking for opportunity and options. And those opportunity and options are far greater in Franklin County than other parts of the state. And they are because of the hard work of this group. So first and foremost, I would like to thank the partnership here. Second of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight because it shows that you're committed to making all of us better. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate your, your opening comments for us this evening. I just have a few housekeeping items I just want to share with you briefly before we get things underway. Um, again, I just want to thank you all for coming. My name is Deborah McLaughlin. I'm the coordinator of the Opioid Task Force for Franklin County and the North Quabbin region. And we're here tonight to listen and learn from you. We're fortunate to have uh, uh, District Attorney David Sullivan here and Don Merrigan as co-chairs of the task force and other executive council members here who would introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, and we're all here uh, because we're interested in uh, hearing firsthand how the opioid epidemic imp impacts you, your family, and your community. We're interested in hearing the bright spots as well as where we can make changes. So before we launch into that discussion this evening, we just want to mention and thank Chris Collins and his colleague of Frontier Access TV for filming uh, the uh, forum this evening. It will be uh, uh, shown on uh, Community Access TV later on this week. We also have uh, uh, Josh Solomon here from The Recorder, so we just want to make folks aware that it, there is a reporter in the room. So if you would like to speak off camera or off the record, just please state so before you speak. Um, to the forum or panel this evening. So we'll also just want to remind you about the materials that you have uh, either in your lap or next to you on, on the seat. Um, there's obviously an agenda for tonight's meeting. Um, if you would like to speak, um, do sign up with Tess. Uh, we're going to go in order of um, speaking. So if you have a number, that would just help us keep track. Although we have a really informal crowd tonight, so we'll probably have more of a give and take after folks um, uh, give their comments. Um, we also have sample guidelines in case those, those would be helpful. Um, and we also have a comment form. So if you don't feel comfortable speaking for any reason, we do have a comment form that you can leave in the box here in the back because uh, we do want to hear what you have to say. Um, we also have a demographic form. Uh, you don't have to fill this out, but it's very helpful if you could. Uh, we're just trying to get a feel for people who are impacted by this epidemic uh, who are coming to the community forums. This information will be part of a report that we'll be uh, putting together and issuing later in the fall. Uh, so it just gives us an idea, much uh, to what the chief mentioned, how many people's lives are impacted by, by this illness. We also have resources in the back um, as well, so do uh, uh, avail yourselves of them as well as some food and so forth. So I just want to thank Tess. Uh, she's back at the registration table if you need anything, and also Deb and Peggy from uh, our, the OTF team. Uh, they're going to be taking some notes as you all are, are speaking and also just capturing the conversation. So I'm just going to have members of the panel um, introduce themselves and we'll get underway. So we're starting with the chief and we'll go to uh, his left. So I think at this point everybody knows me. I'm John Pachork, the chief of police in Deerfield. Hi, Marisa Hebel. I'm the coordinator of the Massachusetts Community Justice Project, which is a Massachusetts trial court initiative. Bob Pura. <clears throat> president at Greenfield Community College and just wanted to say that we've been involved 
um, because we received a phone call from those who developed the task force, uh, John Merrigan and Chris Donnellan and the district attorney called and said, we're, we're, we want to call a few people together. We're uh, deeply concerned about what's happening in our community and can we meet over at the college? And of course, uh, we said yes and uh, it grew so quickly um, in terms of the community response that um, uh, the college was uh, honored, in fact, to, to live up to its name, the fact that community is in our name, we take seriously. And so uh, we would help convene, uh, it was a meeting space, uh, it was a place for the community to come together um, with the task force leadership to talk about what was happening in families and communities and neighborhoods. Um, with their help, we then started a certificate program for folks who wanted to work uh, with folks in recovery. And the new, uh, most recent initiative is the Opiate Task Force is helping us with resources so that folks who are in recovery uh, uh, and, and want to see education as part of their pathway um, in dealing with recovery can have that, that door open for them. So uh, we are all in, uh, faculty, staff, students, um, their lives touched in their own families uh, by addiction as well as our our desire to, to serve the community. So it's an honor and privilege to be involved. Uh, community in Franklin County is kind of redundant. Uh, you guys have been doing it for a couple hundred years and I've only been here for 17, but the way the community works together is really quite special. Uh, my name is John Merrigan. I'm the Register of the Probate and Family Court. Uh, and I cannot uh, thank the college and, and the president, uh, Bob Pure, enough. Uh, they have really helped us uh, create a foundation. They have given us their community uh, support and uh, from day one. As he talked about, Bob talked about, our meetings started there probably with 15 or so people, uh, a lot of them from staff, but obviously there was a lot of pent up uh, frustration in the community because the next meeting was 100 people. Um, and then when we launched uh, in February three years ago, uh, 450 people came to that grand opening, um, had uh, Senate President Rosenberg there, had our legislators there, uh, had the trial court leadership there, that Marisa now, who she now works for, doing similar work statewide uh, in the court system. So, you know, I, I guess I saw it, you know, through the courts uh, when, when families were impacted. And it's not always just the the person uh, that is uh, caught up with substance use uh, issues, but when it happens, it, it creates turmoil in the whole family, and that's what my office deals with. Um, I, it's sad to see uh, grandparents probably in their 60s coming in for guardianships of, of you know, uh, little two, three, four, five-year-olds, and it's tragic, and, and it really causes turmoil um, for everybody, and that, that family, they're their in-laws, everybody involved um, is affected by it. So we, the, the DA and the sheriff, and, and then all our partners who were at the table, you know, came forward quickly. Uh, Bay State was there quickly, uh, Bay State uh, Franklin Medical Center, um, and they continue to be there. And, and many of our partners aren't here, but uh, there, there are many, and, and we're grateful. We have accomplished a lot. We saw some statistics in the past week. Franklin County was one of the counties, one of the only counties, one of two, um, that saw our numbers drop. And time will tell whether that was a blip or whether it's uh, going to be a long-term uh, uh, effort that is starting to pay off. And, and our legislative delegation cannot be thanked enough. Uh, uh, Rep. Kulik, who represents Deerfield, Senator Rosenberg, but Paul Mark um, and others are, are always there paying attention to our needs, and we could not do it without them. So thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm David Sullivan. I'm the district attorney for Franklin in Hampshire counties and also the town of Athol, North Coabin region. And uh, it, the task force really um, came to be uh, because of the emerging crisis. And certainly uh, one of the best things that happened was that we got uh, many different parts of the community involved, uh, healthcare organizations, uh, uh, Franklin uh, Bay State um, to get people together uh, so they could start talking about 
uh, not just the problem, but solutions. And I think that tonight is just another effort at problem solving, that we don't have all the answers, and certainly we found out over time. Uh, when we first started, uh, Narcan was extremely difficult to obtain. It was, uh, uh, the barrier was both at the pharmacy and at uh, upper levels, police couldn't even get a hold of it. So uh, it's an example of the community speaking out saying, hey, you know, why, why can't we get Narcan? And then we help change state laws to, to drop all those barriers. So uh, what I'd say to everybody here tonight is, you know, if you got ideas or if you've got a problem, I think that's our opportunity to hear it and then also spread that to the rest of our uh, coalition. You know, uh, we have uh, several different working groups. Uh, there's a healthcare working group, there's a treatment and recovery working group, there's law and justice, and uh, what we want to do is, is make an impact uh, on the community. And what I can say is that I think we've really uh, learned over the last four years that this opioid epidemic and addiction in general, whether it be alcohol or drugs, um, that it's a disease. And I think fundamentally changing the viewpoint has also uh, been really important in lowering the stigma, reducing stigma so that people could come forward. Uh, first of all and foremost is to get treatment, that they don't have to feel ashamed or afraid that somebody's gonna find out uh, that they're in treatment and also uh, really uh, supporting the recovery community. I can't say enough, and, and anybody who's in recovery in the room, um, you're really the impetus of, of the coalition. When it's all said and done, it's people who are in recovery that, that know best on, on how to help uh, fellow addicted persons. So um, uh, just in, in short, um, I think we just have to keep working on it. Um, I don't think that this is an epidemic that's gonna go away. It was formed over the last 25 years with easy prescriptions of painkillers, and certainly um, that has sown the seeds uh, of addiction, not just in Franklin County, but throughout the United States as we're learning. And uh, I think uh, our coalition is able to work on a very local level, not from Washington, D.C. or from Boston, but to really work here in Franklin and North Guavin and really make a difference uh, for the people who are impacted. Thank you, David. Good evening. I'm Cindy Russo, the President and Chief Administrative Officer at Bay State Franklin Medical Center. And I think the newest member still on the task force, as, as well still fairly new to both my position at Bay State Franklin as well as the area. Um, still under a year at this point, so still learning. But I have to tell you, when I came into my position um, and learning of the task force, I was so impressed because having come from a health system in Connecticut, I will tell you that we did not have these conversations going on, that we did not have this kind of group in action um, to address this issue. So I was first and foremost both impressed. Um, then I was privileged to be asked to um, participate on the task force. Um, privile feel privileged because I do understand our responsibility as the largest health care provider in the area. Um, I understand that responsibility not only to care for those who come into our doors, but also in the prevention and rehabilitation process. And so again, feel so privileged to be able to participate and want to take the actions necessary. And then I guess last I would just say I just also feel so proud to be amongst the caregivers that are within our organization who go above and beyond to try and provide for those needs of those individuals afflicted. Um, some of the innovative work that goes on within our hospital um, day in and day out, the listening that they do um, and then bring it back to me. I could not be more proud to be amongst such a, a wonderful group of people. So as what was said um, previously, I you know, look forward to listening to your ideas, your thoughts, those things we can be um, bringing back and enacting within our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. My name is Marty Murphy Kane. I'm actually the Director of Operations for the Northwestern District Attorney's Office. And the district attorney uh, invited me to join uh, the partnership uh, in its initial uh, stages. And 
we brought to it the perspective, the district attorney's office has the philosophy that we are equally committed to outreach, education, and prevention, and it's not just about prosecution to us. So having the opportunity to work with a group of individuals like this and in the community making a difference, it certainly makes our job easier. So um, it's, a, as everybody has said, an honor and a privilege to be here, and uh, we're doing some great work as a result of the participation within the community as well, so thank you. Hi there, my name is Kat Allen, and I work at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments in the Partnership for Youth, and uh, specifically, I coordinate the Communities That Care Coalition, which is a coalition that's been around since about 2002, focused on youth substance abuse prevention and youth health promotion. Um, so we primarily focus on what we call primary prevention, which is um, early on the prevention of first use of substances and we know that nothing is totally effective in primary prevention but we also know that there are some things that can be done on a community level on a school level that can reduce the risk of uh, first substance use and can reduce the risk of later addiction and problems later on and if it makes a difference in um, even a few lives it's worth doing and um, so I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful that the opioid task, I'm really grateful for all of you for being here and I'm really grateful that this is set up so that we're here to listen to you. I, I think that's um, really valuable and I'm looking forward to that, so thanks. Great. Thank you all so much because I know how busy you all are as, and also all of you who are here this evening. So we do have people who have signed up uh, to, to chat with us this evening and uh, Walter uh, has uh, offered uh, to uh, his public comments. So welcome, Walter. Hi, nice to see you all here. Um, my name is Walt Kleberg. I live in Deerfield here, and uh, I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic. Um, and I was counting my figures before, if anybody noticed. Uh, it's been eight years, seven months, and 11 days. Well done. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny, because... Um, <laughs> But um, I, I started drinking when I was 13, um, smoked my first joint shortly thereafter, and um, you know, I got sicker than a dog. I drank about a quart of all kinds of hard liquor, and I swore I'd never drink again. Within two weeks, I was back at it. You know, I controlled it, though. I knew I wasn't going to drink a quart, so I drank a half a quart. Didn't feel too good, so cut back a little bit, but then over the years, um, it got bad again. And, um, you know, I, I like what I hear um, from all of you on the, uh, up there because um, I, think, I think you have a pretty good grip on what's going on. But uh, I'll tell you, from my own personal experience, um, you know, I, I um, was kind of forced into um, attending my first AA meeting um, years ago when I got pulled over and lost my license, lost my job, um, lost my home, my wife, my family. And um, you know, it was a pretty rough time. And, um, you know, I... I uh, I, I struggled hard. Um, you know, I, I, I was, every day I got up and I, I said, I wish I could just not get up. I wish I could be dead. Um, and I always tell everybody that, um, you know, when I go to meetings and talk to people, I say, you know, I, I, honestly, I wanted, I wanted to die. I wanted to commit suicide, but I didn't have, thank God, I didn't have enough guts to put my gun in my mouth and do it. Um, so it's a horrible disease. Um, and, you know, every day I, I'm thankful. You know, I thank God that, you know, I finally did it. But I did it with help from other alcoholics and other addicts. Um, that's, that to me is, you know, in my personal experience, that's the only way to solve the problem is you've got to talk about it. And the only person that really understands an alcoholic or an addict is an alcoholic or an addict. I mean, family members who've seen it, you know, can kind of see the outside edges of what goes on, but it's what goes on in here. There's a lot that goes on in it. And, you know, honestly, I, I you know, I talked to a lot of professionals which helped me out, which I swore I'd never do in my life. But, um, you know, it worked. And, uh, you know, there was two or three years when I first got sober that I honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't make dinner. You know, thank God I, I met my wife who, I met her uh, a week before she celebrated her first year uh, sober, so. Um, and, uh, you know, she was a godsend to me. And we kind of broke the rules. You're not supposed to be in a relationship for a year, and I was only four months. But, uh, you know, it, it worked out for me, so. Um, but it's, you know, it's been a long road, but I'll tell you, the, the rewards for being sober every day is just, it's just amazing. Um, my life has did, uh, done a 
turnaround. Um, you know, I've got my own business now. Um, you know, we've got we just bought our second home. Um, and you know, the home of our dreams. We're living in the woods in Deerfield here with deer in my backyard. And none of that would have been possible without um, help. And that's obviously what you are offering. And um, it's just so important for people to want the help. And that's, I think, in my personal experience, that was the biggest thing that <coughs> prevented me for 40 years of drinking and drugging was, you know, to ask for the help. And basically, when I lost my license, I was forced into it because I had to go to an AA meeting. And um, I was living in Westfield at the time, and I, I walked up to the door of this church. And there was people going down cellar, and people standing outside drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes. I walked up and looked at all these people and said, man, <laughs> this ain't for me. And I flipped around. I didn't know what I was going to do because I had to do it, get my license back. The guy reached over and grabbed me on the shoulder. He says, you're in the right place. You know, people that are, have been around, you know, addicts and alcoholics, they know what you're looking for. And I was fortunate that I had some really good people. And I've got a lot of friends. And not necessarily friends like most of us would have as friends, you know, somebody you go out and fish with or hunt with, but just friends that I know from the programs I'm in. And, you know, if I've got an issue, a problem, I can pick up the phone and call somebody. And I still get the urges. I still get the urges every day. But, you know, I'm still in recovery, and I know that. And, you know, if, if things get bad and I have a really bad day or a week or a month, and I start getting really, you know, jittery, I go to an AA meeting. Because then I can look around the room and I can see the people there who just came in that day or a week or a month ago. And I remember that I was like that. And it's just, it's a scary thought. That scares me more than anything in the world is to pick up that first drink, or that first drug again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Have any questions about what Walter said before we go on to our second speaker? No, but I, I would just a, a comment that, you know, with what we have been up against, uh, and, and, and five years ago, we weren't facing this problem in this county. You know, that, there were probably pills around, there were probably, probably heroin was around, but we didn't have people dying. And so as we develop solutions, what you said was spot on because one of the things that we have found in this, in this battle is that um, peer mentor programs are, are something that are, seem to be effective um, where people won't trust you know, somebody from the courts or somebody from the DA's office, or, but somebody that's been there, they trust them. And we are fortunate that we have some of those folks with the task force, but the state is also looking at uh, funding these programs and the recovery coaches we call them or peer mentors um, and we're hoping to get those funded positions at more and more uh, intercepts of the hospital when people come in or um, in, the, in the community with the recovery community uh, the recover project downtown Greenfield um, so it's but what you said is exactly what we're feeling that there's trust there and there's um, people can take people to meetings, and you can't say, I don't know where a meeting is, because that recovery coach will say, get my car, I'm taking it. Um, so it's, it's, it's been real good. It's been effective. Uh, you also said that it was your intersection with the criminal justice system. That was sort of your initial push to get sober, and that's one thing I think that Franklin County has been um, setting the bar high for, is the justice system has had to make a lot of adjustments in the last few years, particularly with the opioid crisis and how um, what was typically crime and punishment, um, every stage of the justice system has had to really um, think about how they're interacting with people with um, addiction. And um, from working with communities now on a project um, statewide that's really based on the work we did here, um, I can say that Franklin County sets the bar high at every stage um, and that it's really important that the justice system um, be prepared to connect people with uh, treatment and services as soon as possible and it's something we're doing well. Thank you, Walter, very much for sharing your story. I think it's, it's a powerful story and I think it's important for folks to know that there is hope and help available as well as the struggle that's involved. So thank you. We have Kate who's going to speak next. Thank you, Kate. Hello. Hey. Um, my name is Kate Blair. 
I am a health teacher at Frontier Regional School here in Deerfield. And I think that on, in the notes in the public comment period, uh, we're encouraged to offer bright spots. So I'm here to offer a bright spot. <laughs> um, and I should say that I, I, I came, I, I wanted to be a health educator because of my exposure to addiction as a child. Um, and so from that time up until now and finding my role as a health teacher in this community, I feel really fortunate to work in a district that values health, health education, um, prevention, and has a progressive mindset um, towards health and wellness, and particularly with having the opioid task force here in the community. Um, and I'm here tonight because I know the value of a healthy community and that involves groups like the Opioid Task Force and its members, and I, I want to personally be part of the ongoing prevention efforts, and I want Frontier to be part of the ongoing prevention efforts very much. Um, and at Frontier in the, in the health department, we have um, some really great prevention programs um, partially um, provided and facilitated by our relationship with um, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Thank you, Kat, um, and many others. Um, and so in our curriculum, we talk, about, um, we talk about the opioid crisis and we talk about addiction, but we also frame it in such a way that we are focusing kids and their efforts on um, you know, not just the causes and effects, and we've moved way past, you know, this is your brain on drugs, and we, we don't focus on, on fear tactics whatsoever, um, but we're talking about things like decision making and um, how to cope with anxiety, um, social skills and assertiveness. Um, we, we have the flexibility to weave in mindfulness and yoga and meditation, and I think that, you know, certainly these are not the magic bullets that are going to automatically cure, but they are really essential components to this overall community-based effort to um, address this issue early on. Um, and lastly, Frontier will be having a presence at the Firebird 5K for the yeah. second time this year. <laughs> so um, we're looking forward to that. Anyway, thank you. Can, can you answer a question though? So, um, that is the discussion we're having, not to scare people and, and to get at the younger um, population. So, how, and you talked about what we've talked about with the mindfulness and yoga within that, you know, population that we can get to early. So, what? How did you do that, and how did that? How does well, it work? Well, um, I've always been like a dabbler in yoga, personally. Um, and then it was about a year and a half ago that when I was weaving in some, some yoga and mindfulness lessons, and the way that my students really were hungry for it and the way that they responded to me said, hmm, either I continue to do this and know what I'm doing or I should take a different approach. So I enrolled in a um, formal yoga teacher training and I became certified with the Yoga Alliance and um, the training was great, and so I've taken some of those uh, skills, both in yoga, really meditation and mindfulness, and I've brought them into my classrooms um, in a couple of the clubs that I coordinate, as well as the sports that I coach. Um, I coach soccer and um, mm -hmm. ultimate frisbee. Um, so that's kind of my, my yoga story, <laughs> but, but I really see it as, um, one, being incredibly well-received, and um, two, really effective. Thank you. Okay. Questions for Kate? You know, um, maybe t tying it into what just Kate said, but maybe if I can address to, um, back to Walter as well too, is thinking about what you said and then now with this in terms of, you know, this, this um, you know, mindfulness and this, this holistic approach. Walter, at any point be before you got into the legal system, were there interactions with healthcare professionals? And as you think about that, are there things that they could have offered um, that would have helped? Um, in, on your journey, more so? Um, not for me in particular. Uh, doctor asked me how much drink to be on a weekend. I didn't tell him I drank 30 days a day. I didn't tell him I was smoking to do a book. I, I, you know, that, uh, again, that's my case, but I, I would never have talked to anybody because I was, 
as a as an addict and an alcoholic, um, I had a huge ego. I wasn't going to let anybody know that I had any kind of an issue. I mean, I remember when I was 16, 17, saying, uh, I'm, I think I'm an alcoholic, but I never said it aloud. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, yeah. I mean, with the right approach, it might have been, but just when someone's saying, do you drink a lot? Because, you know, your liver's acting a little crazy. No, must be something. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was definitely not truthful. Well, and, and, and I appreciate that. I think, you know, for me, hearing that, one is um, certainly in the, the assessment um, skills of our caregivers and whether there's some opportunity there because if you're not saying it, but what are those triggers for us? And then appreciate what you're saying around these other, um, you know, alternative ways and, and um, whether or not we have the opportunity to bring those into our, our um, care approach. So thank you. Yeah, I do want to just appreciate the fact <clears throat> that you're doing that work and that you're at a school that uh, understands the importance of your work for students that travel through Frontier that I, I can imagine that it's easy for some schools to say well this doesn't exist or our students are fine and but the reality is what you're teaching gives them long-term skills that uh, you know really pay off for for uh, if for if for everybody that that goes through your program, but certainly as a prevention method, it's really powerful. So, just want to say congratulations. Thank you. And we'll be in touch. Thank <laughs> <laughs> yep. yes. you. Kate, I also want to thank you because I know from a law enforcement perspective, we see it on a daily basis. And what we do see is society's changing as a whole. We see our kids growing up now. I have a seven and nine year old, and the world is at their fingertips. They have access to the internet. And what happens is they are becoming a much more stressful environment. The environment in which many of us grew up in, throwing sticks or rocks at each other and riding our bike three miles down the road to a friend's house at seven years old, are long done. So we do see a progression in kids, and I've seen kids that are more stressed than even 10 or 20 years ago. And I only started law enforcement 24 years ago, and I can see a dramatic difference. I appreciate everything you're doing at Frontier, and I think it's amazing. So anything I can do to help, you certainly have our partnership. But you know that through our school resource officer, and yes, yep. we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. I think your comments highlight different aspects of this challenge that we have. Um, and Walter's comments kind of talk about more from the treatment side, we're talking about more from the prevention side. So we need to look at all of it in order to be successful. So um, we wanted to also just invite anyone else who may be encouraged or inspired by what you heard from Walters and uh, Kate's comments this evening to consider speaking uh, before the, the panel. Um, and we'll give a moment for folks to consider that before we maybe have a little bit more of a broader discussion. Anyone feel comfortable doing that? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to extend your invitation. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, please come up to the mic so people can see you. <laughs> uh, You're locked in now. There's no turning back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, great. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> Don't. Um, yes. So my name is Kelly Broadway. I'm the program manager for a program at Clinical and Support Options called the Center for Community Resilience After Trauma. And I just want to highlight the fact that um, uh, that what we're seeing is the majority of people that are, um, that are coming to CCRT for support. Um, so we serve crime victims. And, um, and so many of them are coming with histories of childhood and early childhood trauma, and um, which eventually resulted often in ongoing and multiple traumas. And the, um, the tendency um, there to use substances to, um, to cope um, is, is huge and large, and we know that from a lot of different research and ACE studies and such. Um, and so I, I just want to highlight the fact that you can't really separate treatment and recovery from acknowledging um, where the pain is coming from, mm -hmm. and also setting up the, the, the resources and supporting the resources within the community to 
while people are going through recovery to support their, their trauma recovery as well. Mm -hmm. So that's all. So. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Questions for Kelly? Because I think we have a unique opportunity to have a provider perspective as part of this discussion. Uh, sure. Kelly, I want to I thank your organization. You were part of the resilience movie mm -hmm. that was on, and I'd recommend it to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. That, and it was really about... Um, adverse childhood experiences and how it impacts us later in life and mm -hmm. certainly uh, being the DA I see the the trauma that happens to victims all the time mm -hmm. but it's just not victims of crime there's so many other uh, impacts that, that children have you know whether it's poverty uh, whether it's um, you know a car accident it, it, there's just a lot of things that happen and I want to compliment your organization for taking that very big task on, which is to really work with people from trauma yes. and hopefully divert people from substance use, you know, because to develop coping skills. And I think what we heard um, from Ms. Blair was you know, mindfulness is actually one Absolutely. of the, the great things behind uh, dealing with trauma and, and other alternatives to or to relieve stress. So I, I just want to thank you for, sure. for really being proactive on that and taking on our toughest cases, which many times are. Um, you know, sexual and physical abuse of minors. Yeah, we do. I, I did forget to say that we have this, what we call our Healing Arts Series, where we offer on a, um, two or three times a month an introductory for people to learn a variety of complementary therapies so that they can start dabbling in yoga or, you know, mindfulness or whatever. And, um, and it's safe because people can just not say, oh, this happened to me. They can say, oh, I want to try that. And so that's kind of nice. Um, and I, I just remembered one more point, which is that I was actually just speaking to um, someone today about um, her recovery journey. And, um, and, and they have to travel to Northampton to seek out support um, f uh, for um, LGBTQ only support. Um, and so... I don't, I'm just throwing that out there as an option for something to be started in, and as far as uh, meetings to, to attend, um, AA -A and NA. So I don't know if there's a possibility of, but she addressed that as a need in Franklin County. So, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for, for Kelly? Yes, please. Great, thank you. My name's Trevor McDaniel. I'm a selectman here in Deerfield, uh, Board of Health, on the Deerfield Elementary School Committee. I'll give you a little history of, of me and what I went through. Um, when I was 16, I was in a really bad motorcycle accident. That's why I stand like this, why I walk like this. Um, I had uh, fractured my leg and shattered my pelvis. And I was in uh, Franklin Medical for um, nine weeks in traction. When you're 16, it's really tough. Uh, you miss prom, you miss, you know, a lot. And uh, I tried to walk again uh, after I got out and my joint was too far gone. Um, it lost blood flow, so it was bone on bone. Too painful to, to go that route and too young to do a hip replacement. So, uh, you know, I was on morphine, Demerol for months in the hospital. You get addicted. Right, because you're on that 24 seven, because the pain is just unbelievable. So then you go, um, you, a after that, you, you start recovering. You start going and getting, um, learning how to walk again, trying to get through this, this pain. Realize you have to go for a hip fusion, which is gonna bolt your socket for the rest of your life. You're gonna be like this. So um, when I was 19, 18 or 19, I went to Boston had that done, um, it was traumatic, you know, being in a, in a body, first one fusing yourself and then being in a body cast in the summer for months is, uh, is, is a mess. And then uh, after that, um, got a stress fracture in my leg. So when I thought I was done, I wasn't done. I had to go back in and get a Cobra plate and bolts in my hip. So um, it's been a painful ride for 27 years. And I went through all the drugs Codeine, oxycodone, Vicodin, then morphine, lots of morphine, tons of morphine. Then you, then you start getting sick because you're taking so much of this medication. And it's the only thing the doctors know to give you at the time. So um, you start having withdrawals. You feel, feel like you're dying. So you understand where somebody would then 
you know, if they're cut off from medication, where would they go? They would go to the street. They would go to heroin because it's cheap, it's available, and they don't need a prescription. So I understand how people would kind of go that route. I was lucky enough not to take that path. I found a doctor who switched my medication to a methadone, which sounds like still a heavy narcotic, but instead of having to take 10 milligram, 20 milligram, 30, 40, 60, 100 milligrams of morphine all the time to get by during the day and to live a production li productive life to get a job and have a family and continue working, you've got to try and take all this medication and it kills you. So finally I had a doctor, you know, I gave up on it. I was just dying this. I threw the morphine back. I can't do this anymore. And you can't go cold turkey either and you're in a lot of pain. So one doctor gave me methadone, and I've been on that for maybe 10 years. Same method, same, same dose, no increase, no withdrawals, simple medication, to, and it's still in pain constantly, but you're not, you're not going through those ups and downs. And I wonder if the medical community could look at that a little further and stop you know, I, I think we've recognized that we can't keep feeding drugs to people, but when you're in my situation where you don't have a choice, you have to take some medication, the hard methadone and the Oxycontin and the Vicodin, they're just not good for people. Methadone, I don't know what the long-term history will be for me, but it's allowed me to run for select board, raise a family, become a selectman, be a productive member in my community, make good money at my job, I function every day, and I never had to go that route of, you know, of taking heroin. I don't know where my life would be without that. So this year I'm lucky enough that I can get my hip replaced, and I'm in that process, so we'll see how that all turns out. But I just wanted to share that, that story with you. Very think sure. about that. Yeah. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Boy, Thank you. Thank you, Trevor, for sharing that story. I think that's another aspect of this, um, this continuum we're looking at, you know, uh, that it's important to consider. I mean, there, there are people who uh, legitimately need pain medication, and how does that get administered and monitored? Um, I know it's something in our Healthcare Solutions Committee that Dr. Ruth Poti, you know, talks about, Dr. Julie Thompson, so it's, it's something that we need to consider to be mindful of for sure. Thank you for for sharing that story. And uh, questions, yeah, if, yes. you know, maybe um, try and address it a little bit. You're you're right. And and boy, um, what a lot of courage. Um, I, I give you a lot of credit. Um, the pain that you must have gone through and continue to go through with that. So yes, indeed, we have a responsibility as a healthcare um, community to to figure out ways to manage that. You know, um, I've been in the healthcare um, business a long, long time, more, more years than I, I'd like to admit, and I've seen a swing from um, initially being so conservative with pain medications, having um, come into the, my career as a registered nurse and making sure, you know, minimal doses and, you know, checking and this and that, and going from that to a huge swing, a huge swing to saying patients should not be, right, you, you know, um, we should not, and, and right, rightfully so, we don't want people to suffer, but I think we're at this crossroads now where, um, okay, how do we manage that pain? but also understand the consequences of, of those actions and then what we need to do in the follow-up. So um, as was said before, Dr. Um, Ruth Pote is, is just phenomenal on this front and trying to figure different ways all the time. So I think we have, still have a long journey to get there, but I've seen it evolve over time and I think now we're just at this crossroads and um, just really thankful that you, know, you um, had that opportunity and we need to make sure all of our healthcare providers understand that we just don't cut people off cold turkey, that you know, we have to manage them through the continuum. Yes, um, and this, this might be a, a, a maybe a controversial thing to say, but I think you know your experience with methadone. I think um, it's an interesting time right now when it comes to mar marijuana and medical marijuana because I think for some people it's um, it can be just as um, life saving, health saving, um, a, an option. And I don't think we know enough about it yet because we haven't been able to research it because it's been Schedule One. 
Um, it still remains Schedule One, um, but I also, you know, I speak as a youth prevention person, and I know that we need to be very careful about how we roll it out because I think anything that can be. I'll use a very loaded term, but because everyone knows what I'm talking about, anything that can be uh, perhaps a gateway drug can also be a gateway off too, or um, to reduction. So I think we need thoughtful approaches that are gonna minimize harm and um, also allow for, for caring treatment too. Um, Other comments? Yes. Uh, Trevor, I just wanna thank you for sharing the story. I think your story about uh, your addiction and your dependence on these uh, pain medications also has uh, a bright spot, and that's that medically assisted treatment, whether it be methadone or suboxone, gave you back your life, and it, it allowed you to be productive. And uh, so, I hope that the people who are listening, who are maybe thinking about taking care of their addiction, can say, "Hey, you know, if I get onto methadone or I get onto a Vivitrol or." or buprenorphine that I can have a productive life. And I, and, I, and I think that's such a positive testimonial. And we don't always hear it. And I think uh, a lot of it is people don't want to share it. So, so I really uh, give you a lot of uh, credit for, for overcoming the odds, really, because of the physical pain, but also because of the fact that sometimes people just don't want to move forward with a medically assisted treatment. So thank you. And, that, and that's what we do hear a lot of is they, in the youth community is that they were injured in a sport. Yes. And that's where they got their first exposure. Right. And, you know, as we talk about is somebody has trauma or somebody's quiet or somebody's reserved, you know, you find that this is the magic, you know, the makes them feel normal. And, you know, so, again, as the DA said and every, at the, the hospital president, thank you for sharing it. Mm -hmm. what we see a lot of with younger people that are injured. And, you know, add to that a little bit, just in terms of, I, I think, again, um, sharing your story and, and understanding that people get to this place from different, um, different places in their lives and, you know, different ways. And I think that, you know, there, there sometimes are those preconceived notions about, you know, people who suffer... Um, with this, um, you know, how they got there, how, how they ended up where they are. And just to hear something that was, you know, not um, in your influence to, to make a difference with as, because of the way it entered into your life. And um, I think that's an important um, story to share, too, that and, and as caregivers um, certainly need to understand as well. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to share anything before we I, I'm going to invite the panels to sort of offer any kind of insights and uh, based on what they've heard tonight so far but before I ask them to do that and um, and wrap up for this evening I just want to make sure to extend an opportunity to anyone who feels moved to to share yeah sure Yes. Hi, I'm Wendy Foxman. I'm the town administrator here. I know a lot of you, and I certainly know of all of you. Thank you, thank you. And I particularly want to thank the chief, the EMS director, and all the public safety people mm -hmm. who are on the front lines of this, and all over the county, two counties, in small towns, where we have public officials may not have any idea what's going on. And they're on the front lines, and we really appreciate that work. Um, and also because we have so many small towns in our two counties, we depend on Greenfield and Northampton and Amherst and others to have the services. And um, it's difficult sometimes. We're a larger community as things go in, in, in the 66 communities in Franklin, Hampshire, is that correct, plus the North Quab. And so um, we depend on, you know, transportation. We, we have those needs for, it, it goes on and on and on, the kinds of services that are needed to uh, to affect the change that you'd like to see. I wanted to ask a question. I read Dr. Bote's recent editorial. I am so grateful for the work that she has done and brought attention to this issue. Um, and she was talking about heroin, and I was just wondering if, um, and the problem that she is seeing as a doctor, seeing her young patients with heroin addiction, um, as the drugs change every few years, as there's new, there's Farms, there's prescription drugs, um, there's all kinds of things, and we don't even know what's coming next, I suppose. How does this task force also take in 
all the other um, sub other sub substances that people have addiction problems. With. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just uh, comment. I mean, we're fortunate to have Dr. Pote in our in our midst because she keeps us up to speed on what she's seeing every day in her office. So, you know, four or five years ago was the pills and the oxys that were on the street, and then you know she would tell us a couple of years ago that she was seeing younger people. There was no gateway. There was no cigarettes. There was no marijuana. They were going right to pills, and then. You know, probably a year ago, she started saying, women. now they're going right to heroin. There's no gateway. And now we're seeing the fentanyl. So we're adjusting all the time. And the fentanyl, as people may or may not know, DA probably could explain it better, but it's, it's a, a cartel chemical, you know, mixed up on the street or by the cartel that makes it to this region. And Northampton, what, a couple of weeks ago, all of a sudden there was a warning down there, and two or three, four people had either overdosed and, and came close to death and then up here. So in with the Narcan, you know, we, we as a task force distribute Narcan or we pay for Narcan distribution um, through the, the medical providers. Um, we administered a grant through the federal government that um, Bay State was the lead and we were able to distribute Narcan. But, you know, I read in the police saw last week in Greenfield, there was an overdose and somebody, um, that overdose, it took three doses of Narcan to get them back. In the beginning, that wasn't happening. But so that's the fentanyl that probably was making its way up the valley, Chief. Yeah, you probably know better than I. But, um, you know, so we're always adjusting. And it's, you don't know what's coming next. Um, so it's just, it, but we are lucky that we have a lot of talent amongst the task force that we're able to make adjustments when we see something. And, we're lucky that we get the heads up on it. I think, you know, uh, to add to that as well, to, uh, you know, the scary thought in terms of starting to hear about Narcan resistant <laughs> substances, you know, so what is next? You know, we just get to a point where we think we have um, at least an opportunity, as you said, to prevent the deaths using this. But, you know, at some point, what it, what, you know, what's going to be there that this won't prevent? Um, and then where do we go from there? And that's so again, also, I think, really in, in the prevention to begin with. I was just going to say that's also not to say that alcohol is still not a huge problem in our communities. Um, I think that the chief can tell you, um, and we also know there are plenty of people in the House of Corrections that did something related to alcohol addiction. So um, I think even though the task force was created around the opioid crisis, it's really certainly helped us to elevate awareness around addiction, period, in the community. And I think one of the things that this task force has been really um, uh, effective at and we continue to need to do every day because we know there are still so many people and families struggling in silence and shame um, is really elevate awareness about the stigma around addiction and we know that is the number one reason why people don't ask for help and the more that people like Walt tells his story and that we talk about this the, the easier it is for people to um, to ask for help I mean we know this is like any other medical condition the earlier you intervene the, the better the outcomes are for the person. So in order for Franklin County to be a recovery-friendly community, right, we need um, there to be no wrong door, which means also your neighbor's door, right? So if your neighbor knows that there's a number to call to get help, um, you know, we need everybody to be armed with all of this information, and that's a continuous process, right? It's not just getting the task force started. It's getting the task force started and keeping the conversation going like this and with our neighbors every day, so... listening session, unless there are any more comments, is that I would just like to invite, you know, the, the panelists to, <coughs> if they would like to, to offer any kind of uh, thoughts or insights in addition to what you've already shared, based on what you've heard tonight from our, our speakers. Any kind of takeaways uh, that you want to make sure that we consider, um, you know, at the task force. Um, and, and, as, and as you're pondering that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first of four community listening sessions we'll be having. We're having one in Shelburne Falls um, next Tuesday. We'll have one on June 1st in Athol and one on June 8th in Greenfield. So we'll continue to listen and learn uh, from these experiences this evening and uh, take your written comments and any feedback that you give us 
and it'll become part of a report that we will issue to the community in the fall uh, that will continue to help us keep the conversation going about the importance of, of this work. So any kind of insights, closing thoughts you'd like to share with, with us before we wrap things up for this evening? I have one thing. I know it's not a big surprise. I have one more thing to say. That's why we like you. <laughs> um, I just, if you don't already know about Learn to Cope and you or someone that you know um, in the community, it's an extremely good resource. So it's for family members who have an, somebody in their family who's been struggling. And there's a meeting on Tuesday nights at Greenfield Community College. Thank you, Greenfield Community College, again. Um, and um, I've sat in on a number of their meetings. And number one, they're anonymous. Um, and people really hold true to that. Um, and there is an enormous amount of wisdom that's shared across that table that's um, uh, unlike any other wisdom I've seen shared um, because a parent or a family member who's been there and is on the other side um, is, can certainly um, help a family, another person like I've never seen. Uh, so because really this is, it's a family disease and um, nobody gives you the blueprint for this. So learn to cope is really a way that people support each other but also um, learn how to be in relationship with, with their loved one in the, mo in the healthiest way possible, which is an enormous uh, challenge. So um, learn to cope is also online and there's a 20, if you don't feel, if somebody doesn't, anybody doesn't feel comfortable going to an in-person meeting, there's a 24 hour a day meeting basically of an online forum where you can start to get um, get help. So I just um, keep that resource tucked in the back of your mind if someone's talking with you. I'd like to just piggyback on something that Marisa had talked about too in terms of continuing the conversation. And I think one of the added benefits of the ongoing communication is there's been an, an, an attempt to break the stigma. Uh, there, what I have seen, what I've witnessed, I'm now going into my 30th year um, in, in this work, and I've seen a drastic reduction in those silos of separation with law enforcement and social service agencies. And we're all coming together uh, with a common mission and a common voice uh, with the, you know, the focus on public safety, public health, and I think it's a wonderful time to be able to come forward, seek the guidance and the support that you need, uh, all in the effort to break that stigma, to try to get people the help that they need. So I think the time is right. Um, I think continuing the conversation is essential. Uh, and I think, as many of you in the room recognize, Franklin County is certainly leading the effort in terms of this initiative. And it's, it's a really exciting time. It's just important that we bring it back to our communities and let uh, everybody know that you know, this needs to happen, the conversation needs to happen. Marty's been in this work for 30 years, but she started when she was four. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love Marisa. <laughs> Um, I also just wanted to sort of extend an invitation and make sure that folks knew um, the Communities That Care Coalition in close collaboration with the Opioid Task Force has a couple of work groups. One is the um, policy and practice, practice change work group. And there are a couple of key statewide things going on right now that we would love to get as much support with as possible. One is there's a statewide alcohol task force right now reviewing all of the state laws on alcohol, all, all the regulations on alcohol use. And this was brought about by the alcohol industry. Um, so you can imagine there's, you know, there's, there's a lot at stake. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning more, getting involved with that, um, our policy and practice change workplace uh, work group is a place for that. And likewise, with the new marijuana legislation, we are weighing in with our legislators and um, you know, getting ready to also think about um, town bylaws that would be most appropriate depending on how the state legislation rolls out. Um, so we would love to have your participation in that if you're interested. Likewise, we have a parent education work group that works on communicating with parents, um, and we invite you to that as well. So let me know. Um, talk to me if you have any interest. To close from my perspective, I'd like to thank everybody here from the audience again to the panel. I think over the, the time period that I've been involved in 24 years since 1993, there's been a dramatic shift in law enforcement. I came under the Bill Clinton era with a crime and justice bill where we were arresting everybody in sight. If you had a joint on you, we were taking you into custody. And there has been such a dramatic shift 
that now we are a true partnership. There are dangerous drugs coming up here. And it's very important that DA Sullivan get recognized for the anti-crime task force because they are focusing on volume dealers. And the reason that Greenfield, Deerfield, Northampton, Amherst had a heads up about fentanyl and the overdoses was the partnerships of that task force. Because what's in Boston and works its way up from New York hit Worcester first. Worcester had in excess of 20 deaths in 24 hours. The medical examiner's office was overwhelmed. Our anti-crime task force got phone calls from the Worcester region and immediately we were alerting all police departments in Hampshire and Franklin County because of his incredible partnerships across the state. So with that said, there's been a total breakdown in the police philosophy. We are now a partner. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we see as a wall and an obstruction is the HIPAA law. And we're really trying to wiggle around it a lot of times with medical records, whether it's Zach and I working with South County EMS or the hospitals or addiction centers, how much information they can release to us, how much information we can release to them. But we continue to work those avenues to the best of our ability so we can have positive outcomes. I appreciate everybody sitting on this panel and the other members that are not here tonight because Franklin County, again, is the leader in the state. We have a start to finish program. We have programs available for people that just walk in the door and say, I have a problem. We have people that are referred through the criminal justice system through constant monitoring programs, and it's great. So this is a wonderful partnership. Any way I can assist, you certainly have my, uh, my participation for Deerfield forever. Thank you. Thanks, G. Thanks, G. You can get free Narcan at Learn to Cope as well. I just want to get that onto TV. <laughs> also at Walgreens, you don't need a prescription. It's very cheap, $5 about for a copay. Uh, at Learn to Cope, they, they do a training, a quick training, very fast. It's very easy to use. And if you walk into Walgreens, there's a standing order there, and you get a very quick training from the, um, and also Prescribe to Prevent has some. Uh, oh, and also the resources of the Opioid Task Force, right, we the website. We encourage people to, to take it um, so you have that information available if you should need it. It would be really helpful to have your um, sort of stuff. Yeah, go, yeah. Okay, no, no. That wall that's always closed. Oh, good, good idea. idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, good idea. We have a resource guide that we can easily put in a PDF and send out widely. Uh, if everyone has signed up here, and I know we have other contact information, we'll make sure to follow with people uh, who are here tonight and elsewhere to send get that information out. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. I just want to quickly add that, you know, recovery is a courageous process. And um, so, too, uh, getting into higher education and <clears throat> combining the two can, you know, keep people away from that opportunity. Uh, to use Marissa's terms, uh, GCC works at becoming uh, increasingly more recovery friendly. And so we have folks on campus who are welcoming those in recovery to help transition into the college. Um, you can get in touch with my office and we'll make sure. So if you know of folks who really do want to you know, take that step into higher education, <clears throat> call my office. Judy Raper is also the person on campus who works most closely with folks in recovery. Uh, and, and people who are in recovery know how to work and support and be with others who are taking that journey, and, and so we pair those folks up together. And <clears throat> so if you're not sure who to contact, contact my office, but Judy Raper's number is 775-1819. You won't remember that, but just you will remember to call my <laughs> office. Uh, and if anybody you know of just wants to connect personally, we're, our door is open to that. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'll just close by saying the task force is, if you were not able to make it and you are uh, picking this up on the broadcast uh, uh, local access, uh, the task force is accessible through the opioidtaskforce.org website. Uh, Dev, Dev, Peg, and Tess are all um, listed there with their email addresses. And, and if people have ideas that were not able to make it tonight or, or have thoughts they want to share with us, um, we're 
open to listening to anything to help us in this uh, uh, battle, this epidemic in this region. But, uh, you know, I'll close on a bright spot. I, I know for a fact that this effort has helped families. I have had families tell me personally that because of the awareness, and, I, and I'll even say the recorder. I mean, the recorder uh, for two years in a row did like a week-long series and, and worked with us to, to talk about what the signs were, the awareness issues. So um, it is important that we talk about it because people then recognize it. Um, and I will say this, that, you know, our experience is the sooner you get it, the, 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 the better chance you have at saving somebody for their, their, their entire life because, you know, you can't think little Johnny when he was 14 got his grades up and I know he'll quit this. If somebody's doing heroin, it's a war and you need to fight it. Mm -hmm. So. And I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all the panelists for being here. Thank you. If you have food in the back, there's also kitty bags. Please feel free to take some food with you. Uh, some of you will we'll go to waste. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm sure we'll have time for a few questions at the end. Um, but I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for being here this